This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 96, for broadcast on the 9th of August, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, fresh insights into the way near-Earth asteroids evolve over time, the ongoing mystery of the Sun's superheated corona, and the Kremlin unveils its new Russian orbital space station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Five new studies have just been published, providing fresh insights into the ways that near-Earth asteroids threatening the Earth change over time. Back in 2022, NASA's DART mission showed how a spacecraft impactor could be used to deflect an asteroid that was on a collision course with the Earth. The DART, or Double Asteroid Redirection Test, saw a probe crash into a small moon called Dimorphos, which orbits around an asteroid called Didymos. The impact shortened Dimorphos' orbit around Didymos by around 32 minutes. It was an impressive feat, and scientists have since been poring over all the data for additional information. World have now published all that information in five new studies in the journal Nature Communications. NASA's lead scientist for solar system small bodies, Thomas Statler, says the findings provide new insights into the way that asteroids can change over time. That's important not just for understanding the near-Earth objects that are the focus of planetary defence, but also for science's ability to read the history of our solar system from these remnants of planetary formation. From the images captured by DART and its accompanying Lucia Cube CubeSat, the authors observed the small asteroid Dimorphos' topography, which featured boulders of various sizes. Now, in comparison, the larger asteroid Didymos was far smoother at lower elevations, though still rocky at higher elevations, and with a lot more craters than Dimorphos. Now, the authors think that Dimorphos likely spun off Didymos in a large mass shedding event. There are natural processes that can accelerate the spins of small asteroids. And there's growing evidence that these processes may be responsible for reshaping these bodies, or even forcing material to be spun off their surfaces. Analysis suggests that both Didymos and Dimorphos have very weak surface characteristics. That led the team to suggest that Didymos had a surface age 40 to 130 times older than Dimorphos, with the former estimated to be around 12.5 million years old, while the latter is probably less than 300,000 years old. The authors think the lower surface strength of Dimorphos likely contributed to DART's significant impact on its orbit. The images and data that DART collected at the Didymos system are providing a unique opportunity for up-close geological observations of near-Earth asteroid binary systems. From these observations, scientists are able to infer a great deal about the geophysical properties of both Dimorphos and Didymos and expand their understanding on the formation of both asteroids. One of the papers compared the shapes and sizes of the various boulders and their distribution patterns across the two asteroids. It determined that the physical characteristics of Dimorphos indicate it was formed in stages, likely from material inherited from its parent asteroid Didymos. That conclusion reinforces a prevailing theory that some binary asteroid systems arise from shedding remnants of a larger primary asteroid accumulating into a new asteroid moonlet. Interestingly, before they settled on the name Dimorphos, the moon around Didymos was originally going to be called Diddy Moon which sort of reflects that way of thinking. The research team also found that thermal fatigue, that's the gradual weakening and cracking of material caused by heat, could rapidly break up boulders on the surface of Dimorphos, generating surface lines and altering the physical characteristics of this type of asteroid more quickly than previously thought. The authors were also able to determine that Didymos's bearing capacity, that is, the surface's ability to support applied loads, was at least a thousand times lower than that of dry sand on Earth or even lunar regolith. Now, all this is considered an important parameter for understanding and predicting the response of a surface, including for the purpose of displacing an asteroid. An analysis of surface boulders on Dimorphos, comparing them with those on other rubble pile asteroids including Itakawa, Ryugu and Bennu, showed that the boulders all shared similar characteristics. And that suggests that all these types of asteroids formed and evolved in a similar fashion. The authors also noted that the elongated nature of the boulders around the Dart impact site implied that they were likely formed through that impacting process. In other words, they were ejector from the crash. 
These latest findings are forming a more robust overview of the origins of the Didymos system, and they're adding to science's understanding of how such planetary bodies are formed. The European Space Agency's HERA mission is now preparing for its launch in October to the Dimorphos Didymos system. Once there, in 2026, it'll further analyse the aftermath of the impact event. And so this research is providing a series of tests for what HERA will likely find and contribute to both current and future exploration missions while bolstering planetary defence capabilities. This is Space Time. Still to come, there are more questions than answers as the ongoing mystery of the Sun's superheated corona continues to baffle scientists. And the Kremlin unveils the final design for its new Russian orbital space station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The further one moves away from a heat source, the cooler it tends to get. Yet, for some mysterious reason, that's not true for our sun. Our local star has a core temperature of over 15 million degrees Celsius and a surface temperature of around 6,000 degrees. However, the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, has a temperature back into the millions of degrees. That's hundreds of times hotter than its surface, despite being much further away from the ultimate source of the heat, the sun's core. Now, by diving into the sun's corona, NASA's Parker Solar Probe has ruled out what are called S-shaped bends in the sun's magnetic field as a potential cause for the corona's searing hot temperatures. How the corona's heat seemingly defies physics has been stumping scientists for decades. Yet it allows the sun's hot supercharged particles or plasma to move fast enough to escape the sun's gravitational pull and bathe our entire solar system as the solar wind. NASA's Parker Solar Probe was built to solve this mystery by diving into the corona to find its heat source. The spacecraft's equipped with a set of instruments designed to directly measure the density, temperature and flow of the corona's plasma. And scientists thought they may have been on the right track because when it first approached the sun, the probe detected hundreds of weird S-shaped bends in the sun's magnetic field. They were named switchbacks in reference to how they briefly reversed direction of the magnetic field along with thousands of shallower bends. To some scientists, these switchbacks seemed like a promising source of heat to the corona and solar wind. Their severe S-shaped bends stored lots of magnetic energy, which likely released into the surrounding plasma as the switchbacks travelled through space and eventually straightened out. Scientists figured that all this energy had to go somewhere, and so it could be contributing to the heating of the corona and the acceleration of the solar wind. The problem is, to heat the corona, these switchbacks need to be moving through it. So, learning where the switchbacks form was critical to understanding their influence on the corona's temperature. Now, after poring over all the data from the Parker Solar Probe's first 14 laps around the Sun, scientists discovered that while the S-shaped bends are common in the solar wind near the Sun, they're absent inside the corona. To make matters worse, scientists still can't agree on what's actually causing the switchbacks. Some think the magnetic field's being bent by turbulence in the solar wind beyond the corona. Others think the switchbacks are starting their journey at the solar surface when churning magnetic field lines and loops explosively collide, combining into bent shapes. But the study's new results, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, are ruling out the latter hypothesis. If switchbacks were being formed by colliding magnetic fields at the surface of the Sun, they ought to be even more common inside the corona. And that's just not the case. Other scientists are proposing that magnetic collisions could still be playing an indirect role in the origins of the switchbacks and therefore the heating of the corona. One idea suggests that while they must be formed outside the corona, there could be a trigger mechanism inside the corona that causes switchbacks to form in the solar wind. When the magnetic fields collide with the sun's surface, they vibrate like plucked guitar strings and send waves along the magnetic field lines into space. At the same time, the energy from these collisions creates fast streams of plasma in the solar wind. And it's this fast plasma which distorts the magnetic waves into switchbacks in the solar wind. And if some of these waves dissipate inside the solar atmosphere before becoming switchbacks, they could also be playing a part in hitting the corona. So the mechanisms which cause the formation of the switchbacks and the switchbacks themselves could heat both the corona and the solar wind. 
Trouble is, there's currently not enough data to favour triggers in the sun's surface over turbulence in the solar wind as the cause for the switchbacks. The Parker Solar Probe's next flyby into the sun will be on December the 24th. There, it will pass even closer, collecting even more data, which could further test various hypotheses. And needless to say, we'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, the Kremlin unveils its latest design for a Russian orbital space station, and the red supergiant Antares, the second nearest star system to the Sun, and the peak of the annual Perseids meteor shower are among the highlights of the August night skies on Skywatch. Russia has unveiled the latest designs and timeline for its new space station. Work on the core module, a research and power node, has been underway for several years now at the Russian rocket company Energia, but ongoing delays and cost overruns have repeatedly pushed the project back. Now, Moscow's insisting it's looking at a launch date in 2027. But of course, that schedule doesn't just depend on Energia, it also depends on the success of Russia's next generation heavy lift rocket, the Angara A5. So far, the Angara's had three successful and one failed orbital test flight since 2014. But the leadership of Russia's Federal Space Agency Roscosmos are confident of smooth sailing ahead. They've now released details of the new orbital outpost, known as the Russian Orbital Service Station, or ROS. By 2030, the Kremlin plans to have docked its four primary modules into a large X shape with an additional two special purpose modules scheduled for attachment by 2033. That'll actually give the ROS a very similar design appearance to the old Mir space station. Roscosmos plans to have its first cosmonauts aboard the $7 million orbital outpost by 2028. But interestingly, unlike Mir and the International Space Station, it won't be permanently manned, instead operating remotely from the ground for part of the time. Moscow says the Ross would orbit at the same altitude as the International Space Station, around 400 kilometres above the Earth's surface. It'll be in a polar sun-synchronous orbit that will be especially useful for observing the entire surface of the planet and also providing a valuable view over the strategically important northern sea route. The Kremlin also wants Ross to act as a command and control centre for a fleet of satellites using artificial intelligence and flying near the space station. These will spend part of their time docked to the space station and the rest flying independently. The Kremlin's also been looking at partnerships with other countries for its new space station. These include China, who have already agreed. They've also been holding talks with Brazil, India and South Africa, in addition to other African nations. Russia's been a principal member of the International Space Station since the first modules were launched way back in November 1998. But it's always maintained a very separate feel for the so-called Russian segment of the orbiting outpost, leaving the other partners, NASA, the European Space Agency, JAXA and the Canadian Space Agency, to focus much of their work in the so-called American section. Back in 2021, as parts of the Russian section began experiencing reliability problems, including air leaks into space, some of which still haven't been fixed, Roscosmos signaled its intention to build its own space lab, calling it a successor to the Mir space station. The Kremlin claims it wants to focus more on its own security and specific scientific projects, which it believes have been hindered by international agreements pertaining to operations on the ISS. Then in 2022, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine and heightened tensions between Russia and the West, Roscosmos announced that it would leave the ISS program sometime after 2024. Now that day it was chosen because it expected to have the first node of its new space station operational by then. With delays there, Russia was forced to change that date to sometime after 2028. Of course, the International Space Station itself is expected to undergo a planned orbit in 2030, with SpaceX awarded the contract to carry out its descent and destruction, although bits of the ISS could be carved off to provide operational nodes for other privately operated space stations. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for August on Skywatch. 
August is the eighth month of the year in the Julian and Gregorian calendars. It was originally named Sextilis in Latin because it was the sixth month of the original 10-month Roman calendar under Romulus in 753 BCE when the year started in March. It only became the eighth month when January and February were added to the start of the year. In the year 8 BCE, it was renamed in honour of the Roman statesman and military leader Augustus, who had achieved several military victories, including the conquest of Egypt during the month. Okay, turning to the heavens, and the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion is high overhead this time of year, covering almost a third of the August night skies. At the heart of Scorpius, located some 470 light years away, is the red supergiant Antares. A light year is a distance of about 10 trillion kilometres. The distance a photon can travel in a year at 300,000 kilometres per second, the speed of light in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Red supergiants have the largest diameters of any known star. They evolve out of main sequence stars with more than eight times the mass of the Sun. A main sequence star is a star fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. When stars stop fusing hydrogen into helium in their core, the balancing act between gravity pushing a star's mass down towards the centre and energy from nuclear fusion in the core pushing outwards ceases and gravity wins, causing the star to begin to collapse inwards, crushing the stellar core until the increase in pressures and temperatures trigger helium fusion. At the same time, a shell of hydrogen around the core begins to fuse, causing the star's outer gaseous envelope to expand out into a bloated giant. And now, being further away from the core, the stellar surface starts to cool down, becoming redder in colour. While sun-like stars will become red giants, those that are far bigger, eight times or more the mass of the sun, become red supergiants. Supergiants will fuse all their core helium into carbon and oxygen within just a few million years. They'll then begin fusing this core carbon and oxygen into progressively heavier and heavier elements until they eventually begin to produce iron in their core. Now, no star, no matter how massive it is, is big enough to fuse iron into heavier elements. And so then the star will collapse catastrophically in what's known as a core collapse supernova, an explosion bright enough to outshine an entire galaxy. The end result of this core collapse supernova will be the creation of either a neutron star or a black hole, depending on the progenitor star's mass. The name Antares means rival of Mars, and indeed when they're close together in the sky, they do look very similar. Antares, or Alpha Scorpius as it's sometimes called, has some 12.4 times the mass and an incredible 450 times the diameter of our Sun, and is one of the largest known stars in the universe. Antares is so big that were it placed where the Sun is at the centre of our solar system, it would engulf all the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Its outer surface would reach almost as far as the orbit of Jupiter. Antares is a binary system. There's a companion star orbiting with it called Antares B, a massive spectral type B blue-white star, at least 7.2 times the mass and 5.2 times the radius of the Sun. It's located about 224 astronomical units beyond the primary star. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Sun and the Earth, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Astronomers describe stars in terms of spectral types, a classification system based on temperature and characteristics. The hottest, most massive and most luminous stars are known as spectral type O blue stars. They're closely followed by spectral type B blue-white stars, then spectral type A white stars, spectral type F whitish yellow stars, spectral type G yellow stars, that's where our sun fits in, spectral type K orange stars, and the coolest and least massive of all stars are spectral type M red stars, commonly referred to as red dwarfs. Now, each spectral classification is further subdivided using a numeric digit to represent temperature, with zero being the hottest and nine the coolest, and a Roman numeral to represent luminosity. Now, put all that together, and our sun is a spectral type G2V or G25 yellow dwarf star. Also included in the stellar classification system are spectral types LT and Y, which are assigned to failed stars known as brown dwarves some of which were actually born as spectral type M red dwarf stars, but became brown dwarves after losing some of their mass. 
Brown dwarfs fit into a category between the largest planets, which are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smaller spectral type M red dwarf stars, which are about 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or 0.08 solar masses. Located near Antares is the spectacular globular cluster Messier 4, or M4 for short. Named after the 18th century French astronomer and comet hunter Charles Messier, it's one of a catalogue of 103 fuzzy objects which weren't comets and so were of no interest to Messier, and so he made a list of them so he didn't waste his time looking at them. Other astronomers have since added further celestial objects to the catalogue, bringing the total to around 110. Located some 7,000 light years away, Messier 4 can be seen through a pair of binoculars making it one of the closest globular clusters to Earth. Globular clusters are densely packed spheres containing thousands to millions of gravitationally bound stars, which it's thought were either originally all born at the same time in the same stellar nursery, or are the surviving cores of galaxies that have been cannibalized by larger galaxies. They're almost always found orbiting the halo of galaxies. The Milky Way has about 150 of them, and they're all usually very ancient, some dating back to around 12 billion years. Located just below the sting of Scorpius are two open star clusters, M6 and M7. M7 is the nearer of the two, located about 800 light years away, while M6 is a more distant 2,000 light years. Open clusters are less densely packed than their globular cluster counterparts, with the stars inside them less gravitationally bound and more prone to drifting away over time. Another open star cluster in Scorpius is NGC 6231, located about 6,500 light years away, just near the star Zeta Scorpii. NGC 6231 is a bright open star cluster containing around 120 stars, including a significant population of highly luminous supergiants, numerous white yellow stars, and at least two Wolf Rayet stars. Wolf Rayets are extremely luminous evolved stars reaching the ends of their lives. Having run out of hydrogen for core fusion, they're no longer on the main sequence and are instead fusing progressively heavier and heavier elements in their cores. This causes them to have surface temperatures of up to 200,000 degrees Celsius, and such extreme temperatures generate powerful stellar winds. Just behind Scorpius is the constellation Sagittarius, the half-man, half-horse of Greek mythology. And as we mentioned in last month's Skywatch, the centre of the Milky Way galaxy is found in Sagittarius, roughly 27,000 light years away. The name Sagittarius could be traced back beyond the Greeks to the ancient Mesopotamian archer god Nurgle. Sagittarius is known for its many nebula and clusters, more than any other constellation. One of the largest and brightest is the globular cluster M22, big enough to be visible to the unaided eye. Located about 10,600 light-years away near the galactic bulge, M22 is more elliptical than most globular clusters. It's located just south of the ecliptic, the plane in the sky upon which all the planets orbit the Sun, and it contains over 70,000 stars, covering an area of around 100 light-years. It also contains at least two black holes, and is one of only a handful of globular clusters known to contain planetary nebulae, the puffed-off outer gaseous envelopes of dead sun-like stars. Located in the sky next to Scorpius in the west and Sagittarius in the east is the constellation of Eutius, the healer or serpent-bearer, often portrayed as a snake coiled around a man. In Greek mythology, Ophiuchus raises Orion from the dead after he was bitten by Scorpius. Ophiuchus contains several star clusters and other interesting features, including Barnard Star. Barnard Star is the second nearest star system to the Sun, beaten only by the Alpha Centauri triple star system. Located some 5.9 light years away, Barnard Star is a spectral type M red dwarf, about 0.144 times the mass of the Sun. Our Sun is around 4.6 billion years old. At between 7 and 12 billion years of age, Barnard's star is considerably older than the Sun and may be among the oldest stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's lost a great deal of rotational energy, and its periodic slight changes in brightness indicate that it's rotating about once every 130 days. By comparison, our Sun rotates roughly once every 29 days. Given its age, Barnard's star was long assumed to be quiescent in terms of stellar activity. But in 1998, astronomers observed an intense stellar flare, indicating that Barnard's star is indeed a flare star. 
Flare stars are variable stars that can undergo unpredictable dramatic increases in brightness lasting a few minutes. It's believed that the flares of flare stars are analogous to solar flares in the sun in that they're generated by stellar magnetic energy stored in the star's atmosphere. Lying just to the west of the Scorpion is the constellation Libra, the scales. In Greek mythology, Libra represents the claws of Scorpius the Scorpion. However, the Romans considered Libra a distinct separate constellation from Scorpius and thought them to be the scales symbolising the equinoxes, the times of the year in March and September when the Earth gets equal lengths of day and night. That's because 2,000 years ago, when all this was made up, the Sun moved into Libra at the time of the September equinox. But due to precession as the Earth's spin axis wobbles in direction, this point in time has now moved into the adjoining constellation of Virgo. If you look to the south in the Southern Cross, that's the constellation Centaurus, another half-man, half-horse mythical beast. Centaurus was the teacher of many of the Greek gods and heroes. He was placed among the stars in the heavens after accidentally being killed by a poisoned arrow fired by Hercules. Close to the point of star nearest the Southern Cross, Beta Centauri, lies NGC 5139, Omega Centauri, the largest and brightest globular cluster in the visible sky. Because of its brightness, the ancient Greek mathematician and astronomer Claudius Ptolemy originally thought Omega Centauri was a star. It has a diameter of more than 150 light years and contains an estimated 10 million stars, giving it some 4 million times the mass of our Sun. Located some 15,800 light years away, Omega Centauri is another very ancient globular cluster around 12 billion years old. And it contains many so called Population 2 stars. These are the second generation of stars to have formed and were created directly out of the remains of the very first stars in the universe. Stars in the core of Omega Centauri are so crowded, they're estimated to average only 0.1 light years away from each other. And that compares to the nearest star to our Sun, Proxima Centauri, which is some 4.2 light years distant. Located close to Omega Centauri in the sky is the giant lenticular galaxy NGC 5128 Centaurus A, which we see looking like it's split in half by a thick band of dust. The galaxy was discovered in 1826 by astronomer James Dunlop from his home in what is now the Sydney suburb of Parramatta a time long before the bright lights of a modern city would make such a discovery impossible. Located some 13 million light years away, Centaurus A is one of the strongest radio sources in the sky and is thought to be the result of a merger between an elliptical and a spiral galaxy. It can be easily seen using a pair of binoculars, but you'll need a telescope to make out its spectacular dust lanes. August is also the time of the peak of the annual Perseids meteor shower. The meteors are the debris trail ejected by the comet Swift-Tuttle as it travels along its 133-year orbit through the solar system. As its name suggests, the Perseids radiant, that is the point in the sky from which the meteors appear to originate, lies in the constellation of Perseus. The Perseids are one of the oldest known meteor showers, with early Chinese historical records of its activity going back almost 2,000 years. They're active between July the 17th and August the 24th, with a peak on August 12th with around 60 meteors an hour being visible. The Perseids are very bright and fast-moving meteors, travelling at speeds of 59 kilometres per second. They're best seen between midnight and just before dawn, producing long bright trails and some fireballs. Most Perseids burn up in the atmosphere at altitudes of over 80 kilometres. They're best seen from the Northern Hemisphere, so for Southern Hemisphere sky watchers, look to the north with the radiant below the northern horizon. And now, with our tour of the rest of the August night skies, we're joined by Jonathan Nally from Sky and Telescope magazine. G'day Stuart, well you go out in the evening at this time of the year, you'll find the Milky Way, which is our galaxy seen from the inside of course, and it's stretching all the way across the sky from the northeast down to the southwest, that's sort of in you know, mid-evening, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, that sort of time. The centre of the Milky Way, which is in the region of Sagittarius, is directly overhead for those where I live uh, at the latitude of Sydney in the Southern Hemisphere. Having the galactic centre, because I'm nice and high directly overhead, is one of the reasons why so many observatories have been set up in the Southern Hemisphere, because this is where you get the best view of it. 
and there's just so much to see towards the centre of the galaxy. You're looking sort of through the right into the, the sort of central part of the city, if you like. So there's lots of stuff there, and star clusters, and nebulae, and big star clouds, and everything you want. It's all in the one spot, like a supermarket of. Uh, you know, I've never used that analogy before. It's like a supermarket of space. But anyway, having the galactic centre up there is is really good. So this time of year, unfortunately, of course, for us in the Southern Hemisphere, it's freezing cold. It's middle of winter. And but that's what you've got to put up with to get the best views of the southern sky. Our friends up in the northern half of the planet, of course, uh, it's nice summertime up there. So lovely viewing weather, viewing conditions at, at night. But for most people in the northern hemisphere, you can't really see the, uh, the centre of the galaxy area too well because it's low down on the southern horizon. And uh, for a lot of people, you know, quite far north, they can't see it at all because it's below the horizon for them. So they've got to come down here and have a holiday and uh, get some decent views of the southern sky. And speaking of the southern sky, down in the south, we've got the Southern Cross. It's high in the southwestern part of the sky in the evening during August, and it's lying on its right-hand side. It's, it's shaped like a kite, and it's lying on, lying on its right-hand side. And just above it is a pair of stars known as the Two Pointers. They're quite bright, these two stars. They're if you go out at night and you look south, these are the first two stars to see. They're called the pointers because if you draw a line between them and you keep the line going, you end up pretty close to the Southern Cross. So they point towards the Southern Cross. And both the cross and the pointers are located within the band of the Milky Way and stretching northwards along the line of the Milky Way, heading along it, we've got lots of other famous and interesting constellations. You've got Centaurus, which is just brilliant if you get a chance to look, even with a pair of binoculars, Centaurus, Scorpius, Sagittarius, and the next one along is called Sputum, which is a strange name that most people won't have heard before, Sputum, but it's right next to Sagittarius and it contains some really nice, uh, what astronomers call deep sky objects like nebulae and cluster, star clusters and things. It's called Sputum because it's named after uh, Scooter, but not the kind you ride on. Uh, it's S-C-U-T-A and it's uh, from an ancient Roman word meaning a shield. So Scutum is the constellation of the shield. Now, if you stay out stargazing for long enough, as the night goes on and the Earth is turning, you'll notice that the band of the Milky Way, which was sort of stretching across the sky, has now shifted over to the north and west. It's getting lower and lower as the hours go past until it seems to disappear around about 4 o'clock in the morning. It hasn't actually disappeared. The entire Milky Way is sort of circling us in every direction, north, south, east and west, but flat along the horizon. And if, if you then uh, keep observing or you get to pulling an all-nighter or if you get up early in the morning to have a look, you'll find that the Milky Way then is coming up in the eastern um, part of the, the sky before dawn. And this includes the marvellous constellation Orion, the Hunter, which we've spoken about many, many times in the program with its big bright stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse. And it's easy to see a group of three stars in a row, which forms the belt of the mythological Hunter, uh, Orion. And to the northeast of Orion, you've got a constellation called Taurus, which everyone's heard of, of course, but perhaps not everyone has seen in the sky. It's really easy to spot because it's got a uh, sort of a triangular formation, a very easy to see triangular formation of stars at its head, including a fairly bright reddish coloured star called Aldebaran. And that brings us to the planet for this month because right at the beginning of August, Mars is very close to that triangular stellar grouping in Taurus. And that means we're going to have an excellent opportunity to compare the red planet with Aldebaran, which is a red star. Okay, And they're both almost exactly the same brightness, only a couple of hundreds of a, what the astronomers call a magnitude difference. So they're, they're essentially the same brightness and they're the same colour, and they're very close together in the sky at the start of August. So for beginners, the only way you're going to tell them apart is that from night to night, Mars will be slowly moving away from Aldebaran and towards another much brighter, what looks like a star in the sky, but it's actually Jupiter. So, but yeah, if you go out one night and have a look, and you, if, you, if you spot Taurus and you see these two red stars, one's a planet, but they, they look like stars, go out the next night, you'll see one of them will have moved, and the next night will have moved a bit further and a bit further and a bit further. That's Mars. And so by the 15th, if you're out there in the early morning hours before dawn, and you'll see Mars very close to Jupiter. They're only going to be oh, less than half a moon width apart. It'll look really quite spectacular. If you have a pair of binoculars, get them onto this view because it, it'll look tremendous having these two star, uh, these two planets, I should say, right next to each other. And you know, even a fairly small pair of binoculars, you might be able to see one or two, maybe three of Jupiter's moons. They won't look like moons. They just look like tiny pinprick stars just to one side or the other side or both sides of Jupiter. But to get all of that view in the one field of view would be really quite spectacular. In the evening part of the sky, we've got Saturn. That's um, a, You can see that one above the eastern horizon in the uh, mid-evening. It looks like a fairly bright star, in inverted commas, but it's got a slightly yellowish tinge, and of course it's a planet. And around mid-August, by the way, about the middle of the month, there's going to be 
four or five meteor showers going on, and they're all in the same part of the sky as, um, as Saturn. So if you go out and have a look, and you've got some reasonably dark skies, you should be able to see some meteors sitting past the planet too. The other two planets visible this month are Mercury and Venus, and both of them can be found low above the western horizon after sunset. So wait till the sun goes down, when it's starting to get a little bit dark, you should be able to see um, Mercury and Venus. Venus is big and bright. You won't miss it, You won't, and you won't mistake it for anything else. It's really big and bright, whereas Mercury is more of a little tiny pinprick of light. And if you want to see Mercury, you have to be quick, because uh, even though you'll be able to see it at the um, start of the month, low on the western horizon, it's going to get it's lower and lower in the sky. So by the end of the second week, it'll be gone. It'll be out of view, lost in the, the glow of the, um, the sunset. Venus, though, is going to be okay, because it's going to be climbing higher and higher as each night passes during August. So you'll, as long as the weather's okay and you've got a fairly clear horizon, no mountains or buildings in the way, you should be able to see Venus all the way through August. And that, Stuart, is uh, the, uh, the sky this month. That's Jonathan Nelly from Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.